Many thanks for inviting me to address this Third World Congress at the ITUC. I warmly remember attending your second Congress in Vancouver just four years ago. At that time, all our minds were very much on the fallout of the global financial crisis on the world's peoples, many of whom had already been battered by food and fuel crises and catastrophic natural disasters. A not insignificant number were also living in nations experiencing outright war and or high levels of criminal and armed violence, all of which destroy lives, dreams and hopes. The truth is, I can't report a vastly better situation to you today, but I do want to bring a message of hope. Trade unions were founded on the firm conviction that through solidarity and collective action, working people could build a better world. That is as true today as it ever was. Your solidarity and your advocacy are an indispensable part of the fight back against the policies and circumstances which are perpetuating poverty and hunger, unemployment and a lack of decent work, high levels of inequality and environmental degradation. All of these directly threaten the lives and livelihoods of many. The good news is that the negotiation of the post-2015 development agenda presents an opportunity to make addressing these profound challenges a top global priority. That's what the world's peoples have been calling for through the extensive national and global consultations which the UN development system has facilitated. Around two million people from all walks of life, including from the most marginalized groups, have had their say on their priorities for a better world. And it will be no surprise to ITUC that they are calling for better education and health services and jobs as top priorities, along with honest and effective governance, which is responsive to their needs and which will deliver. Yes, the challenges are great. 1.2 billion people continue to live in extreme poverty and around 870 million go to bed hungry every night. ILO estimates that almost 202 million people were unemployed last year, up 5 million over the year before. The ILO says that despite some encouraging signs of economic recovery, I quote, little progress is being made in reducing working poverty and vulnerable forms of employment, such as informal jobs and undeclared work, end quote. Levels of inequality of power and wealth are also striking. We see the richest 8% of the world's population earning half the world's total income and leaving 92% to share the other half. At UNDP, we estimate that 75%, that's three quarters of the world's population, lives in societies where income distribution is less equal now than it was in the 1990s. These high levels of inequality exist between countries and often within countries too. We see countries like Somalia, Chad and South Sudan where more than 1,000 women die in childbirth for every 100,000 live births, while in developed countries, the number stands at 16. For many children born in the poorest households and countries, future prospects are limited from the very beginning by poor nutrition and little, and in some cases, no education. The poorest people in the poorest countries also suffer the most from natural disasters. Many of these are climate related and they're becoming more frequent and severe. The challenge of eradicating extreme poverty is to eradicate it in countries where natural disasters, instability and even outright war, weak governance and institutions and little rule of law reinforce that poverty every day. I hope that the post-2015 development agenda really will focus on the needs of the world's poorest people and countries as a top priority. This new global agenda is to be a sustainable development agenda. By definition, that should make it ambitious and transformation. It will also be universal. All countries face the challenge of how to link economic and social progress with maintaining the integrity of the world's ecosystems on which all life depends. What is happening to our climate is a stark reminder of what happens when our economic progress 
is built on rates of depletion of our natural capital, which is simply unsustainable. Turning the tide on carbon pollution, while also meeting global needs for decent work, good services, infrastructure, and the opportunity for a better life, is the defining challenge of our time. It requires the whole approach to development to be turned on its head, so that promoting economic and social inclusion, greater equality, human rights, including gender equality and workers' rights, and environmental sustainability together become central to development rather than peripheral. In this way, we can build a better, fairer, more sustainable world. Tackling inequality must be at the heart of the new agenda. The evidence is that persistently high levels of inequality lessen the likelihood of reducing poverty and lifting human development. And we're seeing the paradox in many countries of extreme poverty reducing while inequality is rising. That's not a recipe for peaceful and cohesive societies. Yet the range of policies which tackle both poverty and inequality is clear. There must be a focus on investment in job and livelihood rich sectors, not least in rural areas where the majority of the world's poor still live and work. Investment in social protection to provide that floor below which no citizen should fall and a platform for further advances. Times of economic adversity are not the time to be cutting back on social protection because it provides the glue which maintains social cohesion and builds the resilience of people to shocks and setbacks. We need investment in universal quality services across health and education, water and sanitation, housing and more. And we need investment in initiatives which empower women, youth and all others currently marginalised so that they too can benefit from the progress their countries make. Countries like Brazil have shown how both inequality and poverty can be decisively tackled. The Nordic model has long emphasised social solidarity and shared progress. The constitution of South Africa is built on a notion of equal rights for all before the law. India's range of rights-based laws point in the direction of tackling entrenched poverty, inequality and marginalisation. There are many such experiences to be shared and built on. But this takes visionary leadership and strong advocacy. Here at the ITUC, representing 176 million workers across 161 countries, you can help provide that. It is within the power of humanity to overcome the vulnerabilities and unfairness which are the daily reality of many of the world's peoples. Solidarity matters within and across national borders. Many of today's challenges call for solutions at the global level where there are huge power imbalances exacerbated by a model of globalisation which is aimed at a free flow of goods and services without acknowledging and addressing the needs of people. So please see the negotiation of the post-2015 agenda and the new Sustainable Development Goals as the big opportunity to make the addressing of all these challenges global priorities. The ITUC's voice counts and it resonates with the vast majority of the world's peoples who dream of a better future. I wish you all a very productive Third World Congress in Berlin and really look forward to hearing the outcomes of your deliberations.